Simon Birmingham, welcome to the program. Good morning, David. Good to be with you. Is Israel, in your view, engaging in collective punishment uh, of Palestinian citizens? No, it's not, David, and it's important that we do not allow moral equivalence to be drawn or to be sought to be drawn. Uh, the attacks of Hamas against Israel were horrific. They were targeting babies, children, the elderly and others, and they were targeting, targeting them because they are Jews. Israel is acting in self-defence, as Australia and many other countries around the world have recognised their right to do so. Israel is seeking to disable Hamas and its ability to be able to operate as a terrorist threat in the future. Uh, and that is exactly something that we should continue to support, while of course wanting to see Israel operate in ways uh, that protect innocent lives as much as possible. And it is notable that they have provided warnings in relation to different activities undertaken, that they've also shown restraint uh, over recent days, in fact now the last couple of weeks, in terms of the timing of when any ground movements occur. And it's very welcome to see that first movement of humanitarian assistance going into the region. So to those who are concerned about what's unfolding in Gaza, the thousands um, of deaths there, including many children, your argument is this is uh, just an unfortunate consequence of Israel defending itself? Well, the loss of all human life in an innocent context is, of course, tragic. And, uh, and our heart goes out to absolutely everyone, be they Israeli or Palestinian uh, who are seeing loss of loved ones. But we have now for years seen Hamas, a terrorist organisation, engage in terrorist activities and also use the fact that it has been able uh, to operate almost freely in Gaza, to build up in terms of a sense of governance, a capacity to undertake this horrific strike against Israel two weeks ago. They continue to hold a couple of hundred hostages and so Israel is well within its rights to defend itself. That is an inherent right it has. And critically, for its future and the protection of others and for the well-being of Palestinian people, Israel is within its rights to seek to remove Hamas from an ability to undertake such strikes in the future and hopefully from an ability to be able to rule over people living in Gaza as well. Because if we are to ultimately see a situation where Israelis and Palestinians are in a position to be able to talk, to negotiate and to finally live peacefully side by side with one another, then there needs to be a structure other than Hamas in place uh, to be able to negotiate with. You can't negotiate with terrorists in this type of instance. You can't expect to get improved outcomes. And what we've seen by Hamas sitting in power for so long and building its capabilities and capacity is this tragic, abhorrent action uh, that has taken so many lives, lives and is now causing so much human suffering. But is it justified to cut off all of those supplies, energy, food, water? Is that justified? Uh, Israel, of course, is, uh, is trying to work through what is an incredibly complex problem in terms of how they mm. disable Hamas, how they remove them from power. We want to see humanitarian support available. We want to see uh, individuals who are innocent individuals, children and others in Palestine, uh, in Palestinian areas in Gaza, able to access uh, the types of uh, the types of humanitarian support in food, in water, in medicines that you would hope for. And, uh, and of course, one of the fastest ways to see that sort of breakthrough occur would be for a wholesale release of those people mm. still being held hostage by Hamas. But until so that happens... We can see a couple of people released overnight, uh, but to get the types of breakthroughs in talks between Egypt, uh, between Israel, uh, to get the flows into Gaza that could occur, uh, a big breakthrough could, I'm sure, be achieved if we saw that release, wholesale release of all of the couple of hundred, 210, it is estimated, individuals being held hostage. Well, that would, of course, be wonderful. But if that doesn't happen, my question is, are those um, restrictions on food and energy and water justified? Again, Israel is dealing with a very complex situation. Mm. I'm not going to prejudge their military strategy. Egypt is You can say whether it's justified here. or not in doing what it's doing. No, Egypt is a key player here as well in terms of their willingness to have mm. the Rafah border open and what they are willing to see uh, cross in both directions of that, uh, that border. No, but so. my, my, this comes back to the whole uh, question point about whether Israel is collectively punishing civilians in Gaza. Uh, you're, you're unwilling to say whether it's justified in what it's doing. 
Uh, at present, uh, Israel is well within its rights uh, to act in ways okay. that seek to disable Hamas and to remove it from the position to be able including to those future terrorists, including attacks. cutting off the food and water we and energy. To, we, we want to see humanitarian support. We want to see innocent civilians able to access food, water, medicines. Uh, and for that, uh, if we could see the release of hostages, if we could see a flow of those supplies mm. over the Rafah border crossing with Egypt, uh, that would provide the types of breakthroughs while still enabling Israel to remove uh, a threat that exists to itself and a threat that has undermined any prospect of peace for many, many years now. You've been highly critical of Iran for its role in funding and empowering both Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, you warned in Parliament during the week that we shouldn't be five or ten years from now asking, you know, what if, could we have done more to prevent Iran uh, unleashing atrocities, including uh, nuclear atrocities. What are you suggesting we should be doing right now in relation to Iran? David, if we look at the terrible events that have struck the world over the last couple of years, it's evident that bad faith actors don't get better with time. President Putin in Russia, way back in 2014, assaulted Crimea, launched invasion into Crimea. He shot down, of course, Malaysia Airlines flight, uh, carrying civilians, including many Australians. Uh, and yet the world kept trying to find ways to deal with Putin. And then ultimately we faced the wholesale invasion of Ukraine last year. In the case of Hamas, uh, they have now governed Gaza, as, uh, as we've been discussing for a long period of time, many atrocities undertaken in that time. And Iran, sadly, has an even longer track record in many ways of human rights abuses against its own people, of mobilising terrorist activities uh, such as Hamas or Hezbollah. Uh, and so we ought to be looking at the types of actions that can be taken, listing the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organisation, working as comprehensively as we can uh, with other nations to ensure the sanctions regime is as tight as possible on Iran, uh, to try to ensure that we limit their capacity to spread evil, to spread terror, uh, and ultimately supporting the many brave Iranian people who have sought to see a change of regime in that country. So you think the Revolutionary Guard should be a prescribed terrorist organisation by Australia? The Coalition does believe that uh, should be the case. The IRGC sponsors terrorist activities around the world. Iran has been responsible in terms of driving and enabling Hamas, Hezbollah, mm. and the IRGC itself uh, operates in ways that uh, oppresses Iranian people, particularly women and girls we've seen suffering uh, for a long period of time and yet showing such courage over the last couple of years since the murder of Masa Amini. Uh, the Senate committee looking at these matters recommended that the government should, uh, should uh, pursue listing of the IRGC and if that requires changes to Australian legislation then the government would have bipartisan okay. support from the opposition to do that. Final one on this issue, Peter Dutton's criticised Anthony Albanese for not uh, going to visit Israel uh, himself. Just uh, explain to us why you think uh, an Australian Prime Minister would be needed in Israel right now. Uh, this is a time for uh, world leaders to ensure that they demonstrate support for Israel uh, and also that, uh, that they, in demonstrating that support, engage in ways that can help to ensure uh, the removal of Hamas but also the respect of international law uh, and of humanitarian access. Uh, yes, we've seen the US President and the British Prime Minister. We've also seen the German Chancellor, uh, the EU Commission President, uh, we've seen leaders of Romania, uh, the Foreign Minister of Canada and Italy. Uh, there are a number of leaders and countries, not all of whom, as the government has suggested, uh, are members of the permanent five seats on the UN Security Council. Uh, a visit by the Australian Prime Minister, who is already going overseas this week, uh, would be able to, a, to, to show a different our part solidarity. Of the world, to be fair. Are any Jewish groups actually suggesting this, or is this more about politics on the part of the coalition? It's certainly been raised with me that a visit by the Prime Minister or at the very least a senior minister uh, of the Australian government to Israel would be very welcomed who's by raised, Australian who's Jewish raised that community. With you? I'm not going to go into the private conversations of each of my discussions with members of the Jewish Australian community, but I have had uh, different conversations with those different organisations who have indicated it would be welcomed by them. 
uh, and I am sure it would be seen uh, as a strong statement of solidarity right. with Israel at this very difficult time. Well, the Prime Minister is going to Washington uh, later today for an official visit. Can you just clarify, does the opposition think he should be going? Uh, the Prime Minister uh, should, uh, of course, engage internationally and uh, the fact that he has received this invitation uh, from the US uh, is one that it's appropriate for a Prime Minister to take up. So that's welcome. Uh, in visiting the US, he should make sure that he has a serious agenda, uh, one that is seeking to ensure in relation to AUKUS uh, that Australia's interests are protected, that we are seeing delivery of the legislation, uh, enabling the flow of technology, of materials and of people as quickly as possible to deliver upon the AUKUS commitments. Uh, he should also be, of course, clear in standing alongside President Biden uh, that Australia's position in relation to Israel uh, and the Middle East conflict underway is in lockstep. And I would also urge the Prime Minister to use this time and this trip uh, to make clear Australia's support for continued United States support for Ukraine. Uh, that that conflict and that war uh, should not be let to slide, left to slide and that the strong statements made by President Biden about the interconnectedness of mm. the different conflicts and challenges we see around the world is something that Australia should pick up on and make sure that we are clear cut in our support for standing against Russian aggression mm. in defence of the rules-based order because and in defence of the yeah, sovereignty of nations like Ukraine. There is debate, as you know, in the US amongst Republicans over uh, whether to keep supporting Ukraine. You're, you're suggesting that the Australian Prime Minister should tell the Americans when he's there what to do. The Australian Prime Minister should always be cautious not to enter into domestic political uh, matters when, uh, when visiting other countries. Uh, but this goes to the consistency of our foreign policy and what we hope for from all of our allies and partners around the world. And so continued support for Ukraine uh, is an important feature that Australia should continue to deliver and that we should be looking for all of our partners, particularly those NATO nations led by the United States, and to continue to provide that support for Ukraine uh, so that we are not entering a situation where a bad okay. faith actor uh, like Russia is ultimately able to prevail or partially prevail uh, against a sovereign nation like Ukraine and therefore undermine not only confidence in the rules-based order, but if they were allowed to prevail because others had stepped mm. back, it would also be sending a terrible signal to other potential bad faith okay. actors around couple, the world. A couple of other quick ones. Uh, China has agreed to review the tariffs. It's imposed on Australian wine. Australia's agreed to suspend its uh, WTO uh, action while that review is underway. Do you welcome that breakthrough? It's welcome, but these tariffs should never have been put in place in the first place. It was an attempted economic coercion by China. Uh, the tariffs were never justified and it is no doubt no coincidence uh, that China and Australia received the draft report from the World Trade Organisation into Australia's appeal against these tariffs only in the last week. Uh, I am confident that draft report would have found uh, that these tariffs uh, were an act against the rules of the WTO. They are clearly in breach of the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement and the undertakings that China mm. had given to Australia. And so they should not just be removed, reviewed, but they should be removed and removed forthwith. And uh, finally, a week on from the Voice referendum defeat, can you just clear up for us what the Liberal Party's position is now on constitutional recognition? We continue to support constitutional recognition, but it is clear that to take another proposal forward at, uh, at some stage into the future uh, will require very widespread consensus and, uh, and will require a lot of engagement and cooperation. So to be able to put timing around that uh, or indeed wording around that, that would be very preemptive at this stage, just one week on uh, from the referendum. I think the referendum demonstrated that Australians put a premium and a priority mm. on practical action uh, and that is where work in terms of auditing uh, the expenditure across all areas of Indigenous programs is a way to ensure that is focused on practical outcomes and greater effectiveness and efficacy across those programs. Work in terms of uh, undertaking a Royal Commission into child sexual abuse uh, would be a way of focusing on getting more practical steps and outcomes to tackle that 
terrible, terrible scourge well, that occurs. Most of the Indigenous uh, health and uh, child welfare groups disagree on that, and so does your colleague Bridget Archer. She crossed the floor in relation to this idea of a, a royal commission. She told The Guardian uh, Peter Dutton appeared to be weaponising child abuse for some perceived political advantage. Is he? No. Bridget is a dear friend and colleague, and, uh, and I respect her, and particularly in relation to child sexual abuse. She brings a very personal understanding of these issues. Uh, however, there are clear challenges that exist. The work of the Northern Territory Children's but there are in many communities. over the I recent mean, her, her, years... Her point, sorry to butt in there, her oh. point is um, why just Indigenous communities? Why not look at well, I, sex I abuse in exactly, all communities? Well, David, that's exactly what I was answering and addressing when okay. you butted in, uh, and that is the work of the Northern Territory Children's Commissioner has seen a significant surge in terms of reported instances of abuse or concern. Some 30,000 additional reports in terms of concern, around 10% of those in that report identified as being child sexual abuse matters. So there are issues that, uh, that are sadly on the rise, that are particular in terms of uh, remote communities, and, and that is a tragedy that, uh, that ought to be pursued and addressed in a thoughtful, calm way. Uh, and ought to be something that could have the support across the political landscape to be undertaken. But are you, are you talking about a Royal Commission into just remote communities or into child sex abuse broadly? Oh, David, again, the terms of reference are something that would be, I imagine, drafted in consultation, uh, ideally with the Northern Territory and preferably with other states. Uh, but I think one thing we've seen so about it could, it Royal could, It could be broader than just remote communities. I think, well, I think one thing we've seen in terms of royal commissions is that recent ones that have been very, very broad uh, can take a very long time and can become incredibly complex in their undertaking. So uh, the more focused uh, you can make a royal commission, the more effective, I believe, its, uh, its outcomes uh, and approach is likely to be. All right. You're open to a broader look at not just Indigenous communities. Well, an effective approach in terms of Royal Commission would be to have the cooperation of states and territories uh, to look at uh, child sexual abuse in Indigenous communities and, uh, and to make sure that it was really focused where the problems were seen as most significant. The evidence in the Northern Territory shows that, uh, that there has been that spike uh, and that there are real problems to be addressed and that's why we ought to do so, but do so in a calm and proper manner. Simon Birmingham, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, David. My pleasure.